In previous modules, one of the things that we've talked about is how computers are kind of stupid. And I know a lot of people really kind of take offense to that. They think, well, no, computers aren't stupid. You know, look at all these great things they can do. Well, yeah, they are. Because computers can only do really simple, small things. But what makes them appear smart is how fast they can do them and how they can do the same types of operations over and over and over again. And this speed and the speed is, which is constantly improving and increasing always makes computers look to be a lot smarter than they well actually are. And so we want to look at how can we do that? And as a programmer, as a computer scientist, we're constantly looking at how can we make the computer do things for us, take work off of our plate, put on the computer, which is going to be a lot more efficient, a lot faster and able to do a lot more because of it. We gave an example previously about how we can do some simple math things inside of Python. And we talked about and worked through examples such as converting temperatures from Fahrenheit into Celsius. Well, we could do that with a calculator, but if we were to read in a file and had to do it hundreds or thousands of times, we would never be able to do that with the speed that a computer could do. We could write a program, have that program execute, and be done faster than we could just mainly going through that file, reading line by line, typing into a calculator, and moving on. And so what we're going to look at in this module is that repetition structure, that process of how do we say, hey, I want to do this over and over and over again. And that's a very important step to the process. So let's look at how we can do this. And Python's going to give us a couple of different methods, and most languages follow these basic tools. So I'm going to create a new file. Python has two different types of looping structures, and we're going to look at both of these, and most languages have both of these. Now, sometimes they're a little similar or a little bit more different than other languages, and we're going to have to kind of practice with that and learn those idiosyncrasies of those languages. We're going to focus here on Python first. The first thing we're going to do is look at what we call a conditional loop. And a conditional loop says that while a condition is met, we're going to repeat the body of our loop. In fact, in Python, just as with most languages, this is actually known as a while loop. And while is a special keyword that's going to be used to process. So I'm going to use a variable real quick. I'm going to call this index. And I'm going to set it equal to one. Then I'm going to specify while index is less than five. Notice that this has a condition very similar to an if statement. In fact, almost anything that you put inside of an if statement condition can be used inside of a while condition. This includes Boolean logic, such as and and or. This includes Boolean variables as well as checks that are both strings and numbers. I'm just using a simple number here. So here I have while index is less than five, I'm gonna print index, which is my variable. Notice a couple of things, and these are a little specific to Python, such as I had to indent my block of code. Remember Python, says any block of code is going to be indented. So my while body is indented. Notice I have a colon after my condition, just like I did with my if statement. It's always a good idea to indent as long as the language supports it, even if it's not mandatory. This creates a good visual clue to you as a software developer to see, hey, where is my block of code? What's supposed to go with my while block or my if block or any other block that we're going to be looking at? So even if you're with a language that doesn't require indentation, it's a good habit to get into. 
Python is a good learning language because it forces certain things, for example, the indentation on us, which we can then carry over into other languages. Let's go ahead and save this real quick, and I'm going to run this. And when I run this, you notice that it's just running and running and running. It's just printing out one. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop this real quick and press Control C. That exits me out of that program. And you might go, okay, well, why did it do that? Well, this is a common error that we can run into with a while loop. So let's pause for a second and kind of play computer, figure out what the computer program is doing. All right, so the first line, we set a variable index equal to one. We skip the second line just to create some visual separation, make it easier for us to read. That's good. Line three, while index, index is currently equal to one, is less than five. Our condition is true. We're going to do our while body loop. We're going to print index. Then at the end of that body, we go back up to our while condition and say while index is less than five. Well, index has a value of one. So one is less than five. We print out the index, which is one. We go back up to our condition and check to see if we need to run the loop body again. Now, as I've said this, you've probably seen the issue like, oh, wait a second. One of the things that we never do is we never change the value of index. And if you were thinking about that, you are absolutely correct. This is a problem. This creates what we call an infinite loop, a loop that never exits. It goes on as long as the computer's running, or we don't do something like provide a keyboard interrupt by hitting Control C. So what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm gonna come, hit the enter key after my print statement. I'm gonna say index, and I can say index equals index, which is my old value, plus one. I'm gonna save this real quick, come down my terminal and just CLS it just to make it a little bit easier to read. And I'm gonna click run. And you notice it prints one, two, three, four. And so it prints out all four of those. It then exits my program because there's nothing after my while statement. So we no longer have that infinite statement. Now you might ask, okay, in this test, how come it didn't print out five? Well, when index is equal to four, let's start there. Four is less than five. We print out the index, that's four. Index equals index plus one. So four plus one is equal to five. Is five less than five? No, it's equal. And so it does the stop because that condition is not true. If I want to print out every value from the start of what index is up to including five, I'd have to say less than or equal to five. So let's go ahead and test this now. I'm gonna click run. And notice that now it prints from one up to an including five. So it's a simple little change, but our condition statement has to be very accurate. This is something that we talked about previously when we work with our if statements, those conditions are really important. And it's why I always recommend testing our code to make sure, hey, are we getting what we want? Now, let me show you a little change that you can make here that makes writing your code just a little bit faster. You'll notice here I have on line five, index equals index plus one. Okay, that's easy. It, it makes a lot of sense, but it's a lot of typing especially if you're not using a simple variable name like index. Maybe you're using num underscore of underscore students, and that's a lot longer to write out. But let's make a change. Python has some shortcuts for us. This is actually not specific to Python. Other languages do this as well. But I'm going to replace all that and say index plus equals one. And you might go, wait a second, what was that? Well, anytime I have index plus equals, it's kind of like saying index equals index plus one. It just means that we don't have to write out the extra index. Now, some languages like Java and C++, they actually even have a shorter version. But Python doesn't have that, so we're not going to look at that. We're just going to use index plus equals one. In my terminal, I'm going to do a clear screen. I'm going to run this 
and notice it does the exact same thing. So use that plus equals is just a little bit faster for us to type. What's interesting is that it also works for other mathematical symbols, such as minus equals, times equals, divide equals, etc. So let's do a real quick example where I'm going to count down from 5 to 1. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple little changes here to this program. I'm going to change my index to start at 5. I'm going to say, well, index is greater than or equal to 1. And since I'm going to be working on counting down, I'm going to use the minus equals to subtract 1 from each value. I'm going to save this run it, and you notice that now it counts down, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. So this does exactly what we want to do. It allows us to count down very simply. Now, a while loop being used to count a certain number of numbers, th that's easy, it's good, it's fine, but it's kind of limiting, okay? So let's look at some other things that we can do, uh, because our while loop is not limited to just working with numbers. And we don't want to just print a series of numbers. That's kind of simple. All right, so I'm going to clear my code and come down to my terminal window and use CLS to just clear that. Remember, if you're on a different operating system, you may need to use a different command. So let's write a while loop that's going to allow us to do a variety of commands and allow us to repeat the same function over and over again. This is going to be a little bit more beneficial. And in our example, I want to take a amount of sales and calculate the commission that a person should receive based upon the sales that they generated. Okay. Uh, so let's go through this process real quick. First off, I'm going to need a variable. I'm going to call this again, and I'm going to set it equal to Y. Okay. So this is real simple. And I'm going to say while again equals equals y. Put a colon, and then I'm going to perform my statements. So my statement is going to have sales. This is going to equal, and since I'm talking about currency or money, I'm going to use a floating point number because it's very reasonable for me to sell something that has a decimal point in it. So I'll specify float. I have an input command that's going to allow me to get some values from my user. So I've got a nice little prompt here. I'm going to do a calculation. Commission equals sales times 0 0.02. That's going to assume it's a 2% uh, commission. Is 2% commission good or bad? It kind of depends upon what industry and what store you're looking at. 2% um, commission used to be considered very good in certain industries. They're very bad. And in other industries, if you had a 20% commission, you'd be thinking that's pretty bad. So it really just kind of depends upon what industry you're in. So we're just using this as a number. Feel free to make little changes to this if you would. Now that we've calculated this, we're going to print it out. Print the commission was, and then I'll write out commission, which is my variable that I calculated. Notice I printed an extra blank line. This is just going to make it easier for me to visually see what each section of the code is doing. First, I had my check, okay, is this my commission? What's going on? I do my calculations. Now I want to check to see if I want to run this again. So I'm, it's a different part of code. So I'm going to bring it down an extra line just so I can kind of separate that. I'm going to specify again equals input. Going to get some input from the user. And notice I have my input statement. Now, my while loop is looking for again as a Y. Anything else is going to fail. But it is specifically looking for a Y. And so this is a really good thing to give a little bit of hint. I notice I have a Y slash N. I'm providing a hint for my user. 
I want to make things easy for them to use. If I didn't say that, the person might put yes or true, or they might put a capital Y. They still could, but this is designed to make it a little bit easier for my end user to use. Let me save this real quick. I'm going to run it. How much in sales were generated? We'll say $500. The commission is 10. Okay, that works. I'm going to press Y, hit the enter key. Notice it asked me the question again. How much in sales was generated? $735.87. Okay, I get a number. Now you're going to notice a couple of quick things with this. For example, my number is not formatted. I'm, I might want to look at formatting it using that format command so I only show two decimal places. I'm saying dollars out loud, but there's no evidence I'm not talking about euros or yens or anything else. So I might want to put a dollar symbol there. There's some other things I can look at and I can see and I can kind of tweak to make this output a little bit better. But we're focusing on the while and notice that while I hit Y, it goes through it again. If I press N, notice that it exits. And in fact, if I pressed anything other than a lowercase Y and hit the enter key, I would have exited from my while loop. Now, what happens if my user were to have maybe caps locks on and they press capital Y? They were expecting to run this again, and now they got to go and load this application again. The while loop was designed to minimize that, to allow you to keep working, be more efficient. And when we look at files and other data sources later, we'll see how we can do it there and even be more efficient. But in a case like this, we could run into an issue. So it really goes back to our last module when we talked about our conditions and the fact that we can have Boolean logic operators. So I'm going to say again, equals equals Y. Or, and notice this is another keyword. We talked about this keyword when we talked about it in the conditional statements. Or, again, equals equals, and I'll put a capital Y. Notice that both my lowercase y and my capital Y are in quotes. That's real important. But I'm just showing how can I make this just a little bit better, a little bit easier for my end users. And the more powerful our computers are, the more end users expect them to be easier to use. If you went back into the 1970s or early 80s and saw what computers did, they were very rigid. And that was expected, and the computer wasn't really that fast, especially compared to what they are now. Uh, now at times, they're in some cases hundreds, if not thousands of times faster than those computers. And so when we look at this, we're expecting things to be user friendly. Now, in a perfect world, we didn't even have like a GUI interface and a user could just click and type and press a button and things would be even different. We're not there yet. We got to learn to remember to crawl before we walk, walk before we run, run before we start jumping hurdles and doing sprints, right? So we're keeping it easy with this. Uh, but understand that users are expecting more and more complex things, and this is a way that we can very simply test. Now, I'm going to come in here, save this, and run it just to demonstrate how much in sales was generated, $325. Oops. 325 I hit Enter. Commission was 6.5. Lowercase y. Notice it still generates and runs. 450 commission was nine run again i'm going to do a capital y now notice it runs the loop again because we have that boolean logic operator in there it makes life so much easier for our end users and i'm going to say 387 and notice i get numbers and so this all works for me so this is our while loop and how we can use it inside of python now like i said most languages have a while loop and their syntax will be very minimally different. If I were to go into uh, some language like Java or Pascal or C++, 
or JavaScript, you're going to notice the while loop is nearly identical. I say nearly because it's not exactly, but very, very similar down to the fact that they all use while as the keyword. So let's talk about a couple other quick things that I want you just to notice about this real quickly. Number one is notice that we always check our condition first. And so the while as a conditional loop has a further designation as a pre-test loop. That means before we can run the loop body, we're going to test it. That also means that our loop body may never run. Let me give you a quick example of that. I'm going to come up here to my again, and I'm going to start it with the letter Z. Why Z? Because it's not Y. So if I go and I run this program, notice that you can see my terminal. It looks like it goes to execute the program, but the while loop body never runs. That's because we tested again, again with Z, Z is not a lowercase or uppercase Y. The condition fails. We bypass that while loop body. So your body of your while loop may never run, or in computer parlance, you'll sometimes hear it called be executed. So those commands are never run if our initial condition is not set. The other thing that you might want to know is in a case like this where we're looking for a specific value to either continue with or to stop with, uh, there's both situations like that, that's often referred to as a sentinel loop. A sentinel loop is looking for a specific value to either continue or stop that loop process. It's very simple to work with. It's very easy to use, as you can see here. So those are just a couple little terms. The pretest, and that's called pretest because we test before we run the body. And the fact that because we're looking for a specific value, it's often referred to as a sentinel loop. Now, regardless of what we're doing, we have saw how we can run through a list of numbers and things like that. The while loop is your conditional loop. There are a couple things though that a while loop may not be the most effective for. In those cases, we often are using what we refer to as a counting loop. And a counting loop is typically done with the for command. So I'm gonna come up here and clear out my screen. So the reason for doing that is just so we can start nice and fresh. And I'm gonna show you the for loop. So a for loop starts off real simple, for, and I'm going to call this index in, and then I'm going to give a list of values. Now, we're actually going to talk a lot more about what a list is in Python in a couple of modules. But for right now, we're just going to let you know that a list is a group of related items. So I'm going to put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Boy, I'm glad there was only five elements. That would take a long time to write if there was more. And I'm going to put a colon after the end of that. Now, notice this colon keeps showing up. Anytime we're going to start a new block of code, whether it's an if statement or a while loop or now in a for loop, and we're going to see it other places too. You're going to have a colon at the end. You're going to hit the enter key, and you're going to notice you're going to be indented. And so I'm just going to say print index. Now, if you say, hey, this looks kind of familiar, well, if you remember, we did a print with a while loop using index earlier. Now, here's the key difference between a counting loop and a conditional loop. Our conditional loop only tested for that condition. And so if that condition wasn't meant, it failed, or if that condition wasn't updated, we got the infinite loop. The for loop or a counting loop which in this case is a for loop, and most languages call it a for loop, uses a value of going through a list of items. And that's what we have here is a list of items, one, two, three, four, five. Index will be the current item, and we're going to start at the beginning and go all the way through the end. Now, what happens if that list had 50 elements? Well, it would start the first one, it would go through every one of them until it got to the last one. Well, what happens if I had 50,000 elements? 
Well, it would start the first one. And if you guess that it would go all the way to the very end, you are correct. Okay. This is something it will do. It will go all the way through the whole list, regardless of how many elements. This in many ways helps us out. Let's just see this real quick. I'm going to run and notice it prints one, two, three, four, five. Hey, that was great. On the other hand, what happens if I had 50 elements? I would have to type out comma six, comma seven, comma eight, comma, oh my goodness, when will we ever get to the end of this thing? And that's a potential problem. So we don't want to do that. We want to find, is there a better way? Well, yeah, of course there is. Let's talk about that real quick. So I'm going to replace this list here that I have. And we're going to talk, like I said, about lists in a lot more detail. There's a lot of really good uses for lists. Mainly typing them in is not one of them, however. So instead, I'm going to replace this with a special command that is inside a Python called range. And I can say range equals five. I'm going to save this. I'm going to run it. Huh. If you look at your output, you're probably kind of tilting your head going, wait a second, that's not what I expected. And you would absolutely be yeah, probably correct. You were expecting one, two, three, four, five, and instead you got zero, one, two, three, four, and no five. So range is a special command. It's a function that's built into Python. It actually creates a list for us. But notice it does a couple of things. Number one is that it starts by default at zero. And two, it goes to the upper limit, but it stops at that. Okay. So there's a way to fix this though. Range has multiple abilities. So I'm going to specify a starting point and an end point. And the way to do that is just say one comma five. So this is my starting and my ending. Okay. I'm going to run this again and I get one, two, three, four. Okay. That's because five is where we end, not how many elements are in our list. So it always is one less than a stopping point. So I would have to say range five plus one, which would be six. Now it prints out one through five. Now, this is just one of those idiosyncrasies we need to work with. And part of it's because most computer languages, Python included, are what we know as a zero-based language. That means the very first element is zero, and it goes up to one minus however many elements in our list or what other languages might call an array is going to be. So if I have 10 elements in my list, it's going to be zero through nine not one through 10, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, the really nice thing about this, I'm gonna clear out my screen just so we can see this a little bit easier. What happens if I wanted to print 10 elements? Well, I specify from one to 11, because remember it's inclusive of the start, not of the end. If I run this, notice it prints it out real easy. If I wanna go to 100, Notice how fast that occurs. A couple little changes, keystrokes, changes how many times our program executes or that section of a program executes. Makes it so where once again, our computer, remember it's stupid, but it's fast. And you blinked and you, it would finished. And this can be true whether we give it a thousand items or 10,000 items or anything else. And so I've actually done uh, code examples with other classes and printing out is one of the slowest things that you can do. And if we remove the print command and just did calculations, and so maybe we're gonna write that to a file or send it to a database or send it out over the internet to another resource location, we would find that we can do things, sometimes tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of things in fractions of a second. Computers are really, really fast. That's what makes them look so smart. That's how we can use them effectively. So yes, I'm only printing out something here, 
but I could use a, something a lot of times. And that's a very important process that I want to keep in mind. Now, one other thing I want to show you with the range command real quickly is what happens if I want to count from all my numbers up to 100, but I want to do it by tens or fives or threes or whatever value that might be. Well, I can add a third value. And this is my increment or step. And your step is how many is going to be in between each of those numbers. So I've got starting at 1, 101. So it's going to be 1 to 100, but do every 10. If I run this, you notice it prints out 1, 11, 21, 31, 41. If I really want to do 10, 20, 30, then I'm going to come up here to my starting number set that equal to 10. So notice if I run that again, it's now showing 10, 20, 30, etc., going up by tens until it gets to that 100. And it's technically going to be whatever the number is that is less than my ending number, 101, minus that step. So if you notice in the previous example, it did 11, 21, 31, up by tens, and it got to... 81, then 91, well, 91 plus 10 is 101. And that is not less than that ending point. And so the loop said, nope, I'm done, and stops executing the loop, goes to whatever's below it. Well, there's nothing below it, so it exited out. So our ending point is not necessarily the last number that's going to be printed. It's going to be the maximum potential value minus one that we could see okay so those are just a couple of things that you might notice and see inside of a for loop especially when using that range command now a really nice thing is we've looked at this for loop with numbers and that is very very common but it's not the only thing that we can use a for loop for so let's just show real quick Another example, so I'm going to use CLS to clear out my terminal and then clear out my code window. I'm going to call this now item. It doesn't have to be an item, doesn't have to be an index. It could be any variable we want. It's just the current thing. In fact, you could call it current item or current elements or elements or whatever you wanted. And, and I'm going to create a list. And Notice that my list that we talked about before, it's in square brackets, and I'm going to do a list of strings. So I have apple, comma. I could go on and on and on. Then I'll print in here, print. So I have a nice little statement here. Hey, in my garden, I'm growing, and then I have apple, blueberry, pear, tomato. Okay, I might change out this list. And this is going to be where power of programming becomes really important is, in this case, my list is coming from something I mainly typed in. But that's slow and tedious. But if I can pull that data from other sources, maybe someone's automated, something that other users have generated because they've typed things in. Now this list, whether it's numbers or in this case, strings, I can continue to work through. And so if I run this, you notice it specifies, hey, in my garden, I'm growing apple. In my garden, I'm growing blueberry, pear, tomato. These are all things that someone might grow in their garden and garden slash orchard that they might have at their house. Okay, so this allows us to kind of see a variety of different examples of what we can work with. And when we get to the point where we're reading in external data, you're going to see how much faster this makes us because now we don't have to guess what's in that file or retype it in every time. We can have it coming from external sources and it be very, very efficient for us. So one of the things that we can do with a while loop is to make sure that our data that we get from our end users is accurate. So let's take, for example, 
our calculation of the area of a circle. We did this previously, so we're just going to build upon that previous module what we did. If you remember correctly, we created a constant, pi, 3.141592. We said that was accurate enough for what we were doing. We're going to get radius, and this is going to equal float, and it's going to be an input from a user. What's the radius of our circle? And then we'll say area equals pi times radius squared. And then we can print out the area of a circle with a radius of comma radius is area. Okay, so this looks like a, a pretty simple program. We've run it before. We've seen it. We know this is going to work. And if I come in here and say, hey, let me run this, uh, five, okay, we get an area of 78.5398. That's good. I'm going to run it again, but this time I'm going to say negative two. Negative two. Well, wait a second. It gives me a number. Notice that. Gives me a number, but is that really accurate? Can a circle have a negative radius? Well, it works. I'm going to put works in quotes here, air quotes. It works because, remember, any number times itself is going to be positive. And since we're squaring it, we're times it times itself, right? So a negative number times a negative number is a positive number. A positive number times a positive number is a positive number. So that works mathematically, but logically, I, I see a potential issue with the fact that I have a, uh, a negative number in there. So I'm going to use a while loop to make sure I get a positive number. And the way I'm going to do it is pretty simple. So what I'm going to do is put a line after radius, and I can put an if statement on it. If radius is less than or equal to zero. So if I get five, a positive value, it's going to ignore that if statement. I'm going to keep right on running. And I'm going to say, I'm going to copy this code real quick. Radius equals float was the radius of a circle. And then I'll put it, you know, in parentheses, please provide a positive number. Okay, that, that worked. I'm going to come down and do a CLS just to clear my screen, just so I'm a little bit cleaner. I'm going to press Alt-Z. The Alt-Z, remember, it just does the automatic line wrap, so I see all of my input statement. Okay. I'm going to run this. What's the radius of my circle? Negative 5. Oh, was the radius of my circle. Please provide a positive number. No, I'm a jerk. I'm going to give you a negative number again. Wait a second. It gave me a value. And this is why we want to use a while condition. If I use an if to test, I might get bad data again. But I'm going to change this if to a while. Notice that's the only change that occurs. And this is how similar a while loop is with an if statement. I'm going to save this, run it. What's the radius of my circle? Negative 5. What's the radius of my circle? Please provide a positive number. No, negative 5. What's the radius of my circle? Please provide a positive number. No, negative 5. Negative 3. Negative, negative 52. 0. Notice that none of these numbers are working. Okay, that while loop is going to keep on testing until I give it a positive number. Three. Okay, I'll give you a value now. And that's what we really, really wanted it to do. Is we wanted it to keep checking and making sure we get that accurate number. So some people might think, oh, I'll use an if statement, then my users will correct it. Eh, not necessarily. 
sometimes users make mistakes over and over again. And so using a while loop to make sure that we get the right values is very important to us and it's very, very beneficial. And you can see in a wonderful example of that here, that simple change from an if to a while allowed us to make sure we're gonna get an appropriate answer. And notice I specified that while radius was less than or equal to zero, that's because obviously a radius of zero is not much of a circle. So that was just a, a little extra tweak in there if you would, okay? So we can use our while loops for error detection. And that's exactly what this is. And there's a lot of different types of error detection that we can run into in different programs depending upon what our problem set is. Sometimes it's gonna be getting bad data. And in fact, a lot of computer application programming is about what, doing what we call the scrubbing of data. The scrubbing of data is looking for bad or malformed data and either alerting someone to go fix it or trying to determine fixes for ourselves. This is a perfect example of something that can happen and does happen. It could happen for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's an error in sending data across the internet or uh, an error in our file or any number of different things that might happen. So being able to go through and read through a file and scrub it or clean it, do error detection, whether we alert someone about it or we try to fix it ourselves, that's kind of up to the data sets that we work with. But as we start bringing in data from external sources, whether it's a, a piece of testing equipment that we might be using in a lab or user generated data that comes across the internet or reading in a file or anything that we're gonna deal with, these become very easy and important to run. So this was a real simple example on how we can use a while loop to do that error checking. All right, so I want to just remind you to go through and do some more practice examples, see how this is working for you, uh, test things out if you want to, but this is a really good, simple way that you can start doing it. These little programs, notice that most of the programs we've been running have been under 10 lines of code. Even this one with calculations and error checking and stuff is only eight lines of code. Writing these simple little programs though are a real good way to help you learn how to program and learn to go through your problem solving techniques. Test things, see what does work and what doesn't work and what little changes do you have to make in order to get them to work. As you do that, you're gonna find that your ability to program is gonna be much better, which means your ability to solve problems is gonna be better, which means your ability to use a computer program to solve larger, more complex problems is better. So keep working and practicing on these. You'll get better and better, and you'll see how these concepts that we're doing now are gonna fit into future modules very soon.